welcome on Kotlin not to do list. We heard about many things on this conference we can and should do. Here we are going to talk about things that you should not do. Uh, this presentation is based on my book, Effective Kotlin. Uh, it contains many items about what we should and can do, but it also has some items that shall not pass code review. And this is what we are going to talk about. I divided all those items into three big problems, three big scenes of Kotlin developers. And I believe that the first one is hiding too much. Hiding what is important is not good, at least when people are hiding things from you. Of course, hiding things yourself from others is funny. <laughs> but people sometimes get angry. So we need to talk about it. And we'll start with something we all like. When it's clear it's an integer, it's great, you do not need to say it. When it's clear it's a string, it's great, you do not need to say it. The same with list of integers. But what if type is not clear at all? So such a situation might be confusing. And in such cases, this type might be a really important information. And it's better to provide it. Types are important information for readers, but they are also important information for, uh, for compiler, especially in two cases. So first problem is that type inference is exact. So if you have class animal and class zebra, if you set animal to zebra and you, and you infer type, animal type is zebra, so you cannot set animal. Clearly, the solution is to set less restrictive type. But what if you cannot do that? Imagine the following situation that you write an interface for your library to produce cars. But there is one particular car that is done pretty often in your factories. And you decided to make it default because it's produced in most of your factories. And so if type is specified here, why not inferring it in here? And then someone later gets also rid of type in here because, you know, making things short. And congratulations, now you can only produce one particular model of your car. This is exactly what happened here in Poland 40 years ago. <laughs> and I don't want it ever again. So please do not expose infer types. When types, a type is expressed, when it's part of your public API, it especially should be set. Another problem is with null safety. So we know that Kotlin gives us great null safety mechanisms that help us with not null pointer exception, or at least force us to think what, what do we want to do when null is there. But there is one problem. When we interoperate with Java, uh, this does not always help us. Sure, if we have annotations, nullable and not null, we have nullable or not nullable type. But what if we do not have such annotations? We do not like such situation, and we prefer to avoid it with a variety of different kinds of annotations. We annotate um, libraries, Java libraries. It was a huge difference in Android that we made it, uh, that uh, creators introduced a lot of such annotations to make it more Kotlin, uh, pro Kotlin. But if any, uh, if even though we still have types that are not specified, then we end up with something called platform type. Platform type is a type that has unknown nullability that comes from Java, and we can both specify it as not nullable or as nullable. So we are, in, in short, we are getting back to Java, and we are getting back to uh, typical Java problems. So Imagine the first situation. You got platform type from, uh, from Java, and you specify it as string. So you will have no pointer exception if there is null. But at least you know where does it, uh, is there is it, and uh, you are expected. You, you, you expected something, you are wrong. You know how to fix it. It's a simple situation. Though, if you just infer type, every type, every time, you can still decide if it is nullable or not null. So someone might remember it might be null and use it safely every time, and then new developer comes and use it unsafely because nothing stops this developer. And then out of nothing, out of in the, from the middles of some probably complex expression, there is, bam, 
null pointer exception. So we do not like the such situation. We prefer to eliminate platform types as soon as possible, and we do not want uh, we do not want to let them propagate. Um, they very badly interoperate with our typing system. Imagine an extreme situation that you infer a platform type into an inter type return from a function in an interface or an open method. So this is a platform type. So we can still decide if it is nullable or not now. So at the declaration side, you might, might decide it's nullable. At the use side, you might decide it's not nullable. And bam, runtime null pointer exception, no, no exception, no uh, errors in compilation time with null produced in Kotlin and consumed in Kotlin. To be fair, Kotlin give us a warning if we try to infer platform type into public, uh, into overreadable function. But to be also fair, most developers don't care. So please be aware. Another thing we too often hide is the receiver. So this is a really nice use of receiver. So instead of setting up source entity separately every time, we can just wrap all the setting up into apply and implicitly use the receiver, this receiver, and to set up ID, category, country, and description. This is concise, this is nice, this is idiomatic. Although when we are hiding receivers too much, soon you might not know where something comes from or what do you actually modify. And the simple, the simple suggestion is that when you write extension functions, uh, instead of hiding receiver, make it explicit because you will make it more readable. It, you make it clear that first and drop come from the receiver, not from some outside scope or somewhere else. But a bigger uh, thing is that you should not, you know, you should you should be aware when you have receiver inside receiver inside receiver. So here is a simple puzzler. You have a node that creates a child, and then when you create this child, you want to print its name. So it might look good and so concise because we just say it's a name but it doesn't work correctly because it prints the name of the parent. So why so? So the, the answer uh, you can find if you start digging up and uh, if you use explicit receiver. So then your code won't compile because you'll see an error. Receiver is nullable, so you cannot call a name. But parent, parent's receiver has name. So <clears throat> without any warning, compiler couldn't get name from uh, apply receiver, so it used name from outer receiver. Simple solution might be to use safe call, but I think it's still pretty bad code. Uh, for all additional operations, instead of introducing new receiver, when receiver is not absolutely clear, it's better to use function that uses, that operates on an argument instead of on a receiver. So, th for instance, also all let for for functions with side effects, we generally prefer also, and so this should finally work uh, better. We should not. Uh, we prefer to not introduce receivers just for the sake of hiding things. It's good to keep some things explicit. And the last. Uh, I think big problem with receivers is when we are trying to have too many of them. Uh, this is member extension function. So this is extension function inside a class. So this is formally possible and used in many DSLs, but I would say it's a very bad practice when you use it in a normal code. Because first of all, it's highly counterintuitive. Second of all, it might be scary. Also, it is, I mean, people use that to limit visibility, what doesn't work because you can still use it, only in a weird way. It's much better to limit visibility using visibility modifiers, like private or, or yeah, like private in this case. Also, member extensions cannot be uh, referenced in opposition to extension functions. What is more, when you 
take something from a receiver, here you get A that is both in class A and in class B. So where does it come from? Where does it come from? You're supposed to modify a receiver. You have function with clear side effects like update. So what do you supposed to modify, A or B? One developer says A, another developer says B. Who knows? So it's better to avoid such a situation. It's better to avoid this confusing uh, notation and avoid member extension functions instead of some DSLs when they are necessary. Another big scene is choosing short over readable. So uh, there is a common misconception that Kotlin is designed to be short. It is or concise. It is not at all. Consist Kotlin is designed to be readable. Have you ever wrote Game of Life? So Game of Life, uh, Conan's game. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice game. It's a nice uh, developer's uh, exercise. Uh, for me, it took like 10 or 12 lines in Kotlin. But there are languages in which you can write it much in much more concise way. For instance, in APL, takes one line. Your first thought is probably, whoa, that's short. Another one is, I do not have half of those characters on my keyboard. It's <laughs> you need to copy paste them a lot from the internet, you know? OK, there are languages that does the same with, with normal characters like J. Those are champions in uh, programming golf contests. And if, if this is what you want to do in your life, right, win in co programming golf contests, those are languages for you. But if you like code that is readable, um, I suggest Kotlin. And I think we should keep Kotlin readable by, by having our primary cons uh, concern for readability. And the difference can be well reflected in those two code snippets. So I actually asked quite some, num some number of developers which implementation do they prefer. And I was surprised to hear how many experienced developers de de told me that they prefer the second one. So when you think about it, except of showing off how great developer you are, I don't see any good reason to use it. So take a first one is understandable by everyone. So you have a junior developer and can understand it immediately. To understand the second one, you need to understand what is safe call, take if, uh, let, uh, bounded function reference, Elvis operator, and this weird construction of Elvis operator and expression on the right side. Even if you are an experienced developer, to, for me at least, to understand the second one, I need to read it slowly, line by line, or even word by word. To understand the first one, like, bam, I see it, I understand it, it's clear. It's understandable by everyone, even JavaScript developers. <laughs> <laughs> also think that what if you need to modify this code? Let's say that you want to add something to each branch. So in the first case, it's simple. You just add something to each of those branches. In the second case, oh, you have a problem. You need to refactor that. Your let, you cannot use bounded reference. You, have, you need more than one expression on the right side of Elvis operator. So we need to wrap it in something, like in a run. So you made your bad code even worse. So the <coughs> I think the only benefit of having such a code is that you do not need to obfuscate it before shipping it. <laughs> Good luck, hackers. So when you compare those two, I think it is clear that the first one is generally better. But there is one more thing. Who noticed that those two do not do the same thing? Hmm? So how do they behavior, how is their behavior different? Actually, 
actually to some degree they work the same. So the first one show uh, both show person when person is not null and uh, is adult. The second one and they both show error when when person is null or person is not adult. But there is one difference. Yes, I mean first one we return unit. This is returning something. Assuming we don't consume it, I think the big difference is that the second one shows error when show person returns null. What might look like quite an uncommon thing, but on the end it might happen. And like, good luck fighting that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the point is if you use weird uh, structures, it's really hard to miss some error. It's really hard to have some unexpected behavior that is very hard to find. When you use something that you know from years, you know you know it. it you know how does it work? You already uh, checked all the holes. So uh, we this one based on our general programming experience. We have I don't know. I think we have much more general programming experience than Kotlin programming experience. This one based only on Kotlin specific things. So, so I think the first one is much better. One thing that is connected to that is avoiding uh, avoid to avoid operating on unit nullable. And actually, I have a story behind it. My close friend in London, on a, during a recruitment process, uh, was asked. Uh, why would you return unit nullable? And apparently, unit nullable has two possible values, like null or unit. So it's like Boolean. So it can be treated similar to Boolean, or uh, in general, in similar cases. But you can use all the great Kotlin support then. So the idea was, well, we can use Elvis operator with return if we return null in case of some problems. So I think this is just a terrible idea. We have Boolean to use Boolean, and with Boolean it is clearly easier, and we have also great support for Booleans, and uh, operating on nullable unit is just making our code surprising and unnecessarily complicated. Another uh, thing comes from my workshop. So on one of my workshops, um, as a small exercise we developed, we implemented factorial. This is how factorial can be Im implemented. The sum, sum of uh, the product of all numbers from one to the current number. Uh, but uh, we, we can call it on a number, what is quite convenient. But some might notice that there is a different mathematical notation from that. And uh, so knowing that one of uh, participants noticed during later section about operator overloading, that we can achieve a similar notation, a small difference, if you overwrite uh, operator not. So, well, not noticing that that you can just call not on your int to produce a factorial, and that it's, as the name suggests, not how you should use this operator, I think it's not a b good idea. And so the general idea with operators, one big idea with operators is that the, they should be also always consistent with their name and mathematical meaning. So those are mo most of them are mathematical uh, concepts and they should be they should follow the mathematical rules and follow the mathematical meaning. Yeah, so every operator has very concrete names, name, and every operator can be used alternatively from behind this name. Okay, uh, sometimes it is not clear what should we, uh, if we should use something or not. So imagine that someone implemented times operator to be able to multiply function. So what does it mean to multiply function? So one might say, well, it means that I want to produce a function that repeats previous function three times. But then someone says, no, no, no. I think that three times function should call function three times. Another come and say, no, it should produce a list of three functions. Like, well, they have all the same right to say so. And I think that 
the meaning of operator times between int and, uh, uh, and function is definitely not clear. And we should not use, uh, and we should not define it. Uh, it's better to use some inline functions, infix function. And for repeating, we have top level function repeat. And uh, the last big problem with, uh, of Kotlin developers, the last big sin of Kotlin developers is disrespecting contracts. So starting with something that might sound obvious, but we need to also cover some meat on this, uh, on this uh, presentation. Um, when you have a class, it's generally better to minimize elements visibility, so to use modifiers like private. Uh, there are good reasons for that. Uh, for all elements, we generally prefer our API to be as small as possible. API functions, public functions, public properties, they need to be maintained, documented, they need to be tested. Uh, we always need to consider how they are used. They might be used from outside, so they are much more problematic, and we prefer to keep our API smaller. Also, it's generally easier to I mean, it's generally easier to give people something than to get something from them. So it's easier to, uh, it's easier to make visibility more open, uh, less restrictive than to make it more restrictive. For properties uh, in, in uh, um, for, for pr primarily for uh, properties, we also would like to, to uh, guard our state. So if we, are if we if this property would be public, we wouldn't be sure how it is used from outside. So we wouldn't be sure that it is used according to how it should be used according to the documentation. So when you make property uh, getter public, you are uh, a setter public. You are not sure how it will sure how it will be used. So you're risking that it might be uh, incorrect, and also. It's much easier to track changes when they are in lower scope, so in the same class, instead of possibly on the whole project. Though we need to remember that limiting visibility is primarily the way to express our intention of this property not being used outside. It is not really stopping people from doing something. Just imagine the very simple class with a private function. You think, well, it's private, so it cannot be used from outside. <laughs> you think so. <laughs> All we need to, to do is to sit down and reflect for a moment. Reference the class, get members, get one by name, open it, and I can call it however I want. Everything is hackable, and if you think that people won't do it because it's hard, <laughs> I can make a session function. <laughs> people won't do it because by us making it private, we express our intention that we do not want it to be used from outside. Some languages do not support visibility limitations, like Python. They use underscores to say some, that something is private, and it is fine, because by setting up intention that we do not want something to be used outside, we say that, okay, it's possible to use it, but if you use it, it's your problem if something fails. It's like with warranty. You open your computer and you try to change something inside, you lose your for, for warranty. I will not fix it now. And the same uh, with the same with, with all the libraries and all the public repositories. If you uh, change something inside, if you try to hack it, it's your problem. There is communication between, between creator and user is the contract. Contract is a set of responsibilities that, that like, I mean, set of uh, what creator promises and what, what is uh, this creator's responsibilities to do in the future. And one way is setting vis visibility is one thing, but one of the primary things to set up contract is to use the documentation. Too often forgotten today, and honestly I am disturbed by your lack of documentation, 
But documentation is important because it sets our intention as creators, library creators or module creators, especially in today's world of big applications, multi-module applications, etc., etc. One great example of contract, I mean, okay, one collection of great contracts, in my opinion, is Kotlin Standard Library. If you check out the documentation of each element, it's it's what I would like to see in every library. It's minimalistic, but to the point. So long documentation, very bad idea, no one will read it. Short documentation is both good for the reader, but also good for the creator, because it's not only what creator said, it's also what creator didn't say, uh, haven't said. Uh, take a look at this contract. Uh, we say that this function returns new read-only list of given elements. It is serializable. That's all. No promise what, what is the type. No, no other promises. So you might use your knowledge about internals of Kotlin that it uses platform-specific collections and they are in Java mutable and try to do some hacking like, like this one. So you get a list, you upcast it to mutable list, what works because Java list interface is Kotlin mutable list, and if we used native collections, then it, this check will surely work, and try to check something. But again, you opened your computer and no one promises you anything. So it will actually work in Kotlin JS. In Kotlin JVM, you will have uh, unsupported operation exception now, but I don't know how will it behave in a year from now. There, are, there is experiment of immutable, truly immutable collections, so probably they will be used under the hood instead of, uh, instead of what is used right now. So no guarantee how it behave after a year. So it's better to respect contract. We set it and we expect it to be respected and we should respect it to, for all that to make sense and use methods that uh, are supported by contracts, like two mutable list fully supported by contract provide, provided by the list interface that is specified as a return type, so as a part of our contract. There are a few functions that have really important and well-specified contract. So the, the most known one are those uh, from uh, any, uh, any superclass, and so clearly equals and hash code they have a big and uh, yeah they have big and well um, well defined contract and we do not have time to cover it all but i would like to show you what what could happen if you break it so imagine the following implementation of equals so we equal complex number complex number mathematical concept that has real part and imaginary part you equal it you can equal it to another complex number, but you also can equal it to double. So if imaginary part is zero and the real part is equal to this other mm, number, they are equal. So what is wrong in here? Nullability is fine, but there was a good answer that um, it's that it's formally we say that it is not symmetric. So we just made complex equal to double, but we cannot make double equal to complex. Can you see it? So you have to like complex equals to double true, the same equals to complex false, not symmetric. What does it mean? What what can go wrong with that? So imagine that I place some, some complex uh, in a list, and then I check if this list contains double. So what do you expect this collection to return? I don't know. It depends on how it is implemented under the hood. It might check this to that or that to this. One collection will say true, another collection will say false. So you cannot trust 
such uh, collections in such situation, and you cannot trust anything that uses aquils under the hood. So contains, set, assert, assert aquils, and many, many more. Similarly, complicated contract uh, has hash code, and uh, one problem, what is the problem, probably some of you know, what is the problem in here? Well, we are talking hash code, and there is no hash code, but there is a quills. Uh, and as you know, it's not good when we have a quills and no hash code, because they are not consistent with each other, and they should be. So imagine that you have, I mean, you have two equal numbers. Imagine that you put them all into some hash, uh, uh, into some uh, set, and set uses hash set under the hood, hash map under the hood. So it places element into buckets, and because you haven't implemented hash code, they will land in a different buckets, even though they are equal. So you have false instead of true. So again, you cannot trust with uh, set, map, anything that uses hash map, hash table under the hood. Then you might say, okay, so I, you have a warning in here, and that is very uh, helpful. Uh, again, you might say, okay, so if all I need is that a quill object has the same hash code, why not returning constant number? I've seen it too many times in my life, and I want to show you what happens when you do that. And it's not unicorn dying. It's something worse. So imagine that we create a, a, a list of, with 10,000 numbers. We made a set out of that. Equils is used exactly zero times. Then you make a list with incorrectly implemented classes. You made a set. And a quills is used under the hood 50 millions, 116,683 times. So this is all just because we implemented hash code incorrectly. They all land in the same bucket, and they all need to be uh, checked for equality with each other. When you have a correct, uh, when you use a, a contains on a correct uh, hash set, a quiz is used generally zero or one times, and finding elements is immediately it's it's all one. When you do the same with incorrectly implemented element, a quill is used many times, and the complexity of these equils is the number of elements by two, so all number of elements. Not good. OK, so this is about contracts of functions, respect it, define it, etc. Also, functions, functionalities in, in, in languages have their own contract. So what is wrong with this code? Can you tell me? What's, what's the first thought when you see, uh, when you see it? Why is it a property? Sum is clearly supposed to be a function. It implements an algorithm, has complexity, might take, lo take, might take long. It's clearly a function and not a property. Properties should represent state, not behavior. But we represent behavior by functions. Properties should not be complex, should not take time, should not include logic. They are to represent state. And on the other way around, to represent state, we use properties, not functions. So this is also not good. Because both of those have their contract. Like It's not a strong contract, but there is a, way, a set of expectations we have on properties in Kotlin. And the last final uh, item is to use function types instead of interfaces in Kotlin to uh, pass operations and actions. Because in Java, we used single abstract methods or multiple abstract methods. Interfaces with empty methods to represent behavior. It is sometimes people apply the same pattern to Kotlin out of a habit, I believe. But it's not a good idea. This is an anti-pattern. We, uh, we, we prefer to use function types instead. 
And if you want to name the properties, you can still name the properties. Such, uh, such properties are, are more flexible. You can change only one of them without changing another. It's easier to operate them. They are generally easier. And also, if you want to provide, uh, if you want to provide, a, you know, a listener in here, you need to create an object from this interface, maybe using object expression or a class. If you want to provide on date clicked and on page clicked in here, you can use lambda expression, anonymous function, uh, function reference, bounded function reference, and even if you really want, you can create a class and provide an instance of that. So it's better supported and has much, gives us much more uh, possibilities. So this is everything I had for you today. Three big scenes of Kotlin developers is one, hiding too much, two, choosing short over readable, and three, disrespecting contracts. There is much more to say, but we have very limited time, and so much more is included in my book. For the sake of reference, those are items uh, that I covered in this presentation. Uh, this book can be found on, under this link, uh, linpub uh, com effective Kotlin, if you want to have a discount. Uh, for a week it works, uh, add slash C slash mobilization, it's quite a significant discount and presentation, like always, will be posted on my Twitter. And thank you for your attention, you are a great audience and have a happy Kotlin.